I was bored one Saturday, so I decided to tinker with making a real-time strategy game. For those who don't know what the real-time strategy genre is, it's basically where you control bases and armies to gather resources and fight opponent armies at a constant pace. You could say it's like chess, but you can get more pieces, the board is 100 squares long, and both players make moves simultaneously. For me, RTS is a very underrated genre. It typically has a higher skill ceiling, which is one of the main reasons I like it so much. As implied in the title, I'm not using a pre-built game engine. The reason I don't prefer using an engine is that I have so much experience in Java now that I might be better off just sticking with this raw form of coding. Besides, maybe someday I'll use my coding skills to make a program that's not a game. But for now, I'm making a game. First up, like many of my other projects, I make a simple window. That's easy, but I want this game to be one that's played in full screen. But I don't know how to code that, so I asked ChatGPT. Then with some simple tweaks to my code, I managed to get the program to take up my entire screen. In the first 20 lines of code, I've already done something I've never done in programming. That's nice, but white screen is boring to look at, so how about getting something drawn inside the window? That's better. How about a simple rectangle to show the border of the arena? Nice. But I haven't coded a game loop yet. I've done this multiple times, but in my Viastima Salvage game, for some reason the timer was off from the intended FPS. So instead, I'm trying nano time. Supposedly, this is more accurate. Again, I used ChatGPT to assist me. But I didn't just copy and paste. I looked at how the code worked. It seems that the code keeps track of the elapsed time between the new game loop and the one that came just before it. Then it can update the game in a way that keeps pace with the desired FPS. I did a test by coding the background to constantly change color. It didn't work, but then I remembered that I didn't tell the paint method to repaint. Then I tested it again in I'll spare you the flashing screen, but I got it working. But did I get the S FPS working accurately? For that, I set up a variable and kept track of how many seconds I passed. The timer was way too fast. I sent the code to chat GPT, and although it helped son, it eventually made an AI mistake. Good thing I didn't mindlessly copy and paste. After some human analysis of the code, I found something. In the code, there are a lot of variables that handle time measured in nanoseconds, but the thread.sleep line takes a number in milliseconds. And I was dividing the sleep time by a billion instead of a million. That seemed to solve the problem. Then I did some simpler tweaks and I seemed to have gotten it working. I let the program run for a few minutes while I had a stopwatch on my phone running, and the two seemed to be mostly in sync. Maybe they got offset by a second, but I don't know. For now, I think I'm content with the game's timekeeping. Besides, there might be more work on the FPS clock later when the program has a higher burden. The program right now is mostly empty. At this point, I could go on and program some units, but I decide to set up a movable camera first. In other RTS games that I've seen, players can move their camera by putting their mouse to the edge of the screen, and that's what I'm doing here. It took a bit, but it was mostly straightforward. I could have gotten it working sooner if I had manually specified my screen's dimensions for the window width and height, but I recently had a beta tester for VSMS Salvage who had a different screen size. I want to have this game be compatible with other monitors if I end up releasing this game. So I got my camera movement working, and now it's time to move on to the units, meaning I'm in familiar territory, making entities inside array lists and programming a bunch of variables. Getting some units made was easy, but I can't control them yet. Typically, in an RTS, you left-click a unit to select it. That's easy. I just measure the distance between the mouse click and the unit, and if it's close enough, the unit gets selected. Now I need to specify some movement. From my experience, players right-click a spot to direct the selected unit toward that spot. And here's that. Right now, they only move in eight directions, but code in some basic trigonometry, and they're moving more accurately. Although, I do have a problem with the units being able to stack onto the same spot. So I wrote some code where if two units collide, they repel. Not exactly smooth, but it's a start. How about I get unit selection improved? Right now, I don't have a way to mass select my units. Many RTS games I've seen use a window select. I decided to make a selection box class for that, and put many of the rules there. Now I have an easy way of selecting a group, even if the units are spread across the screen. 
There is a problem, though, with groups of units all trying to move to the same point. I had already seen this problem come. I have an idea. I can make each unit have a footprint point, which updates to the unit's current position every second. If the footprint is too close to the unit before the update, I assume that the unit is stuck and should stop moving. So I sort of fixed the problem, but in doing so I created a new one. I think what is happening is, if the units are idle and I command them to move shortly before the progress check, the units measure a small distance covered and so stop. A similar problem happens if a moving unit gets ordered to turn 180, going near the point it was at recently. The solution I thought up was to give each unit its own 1 second timer. Also, when a new move command is given, the timers for the ordered units get reset. It's not like each unit is waiting for its turn to be at the destination. Okay, I would like to decrease the amount of distance the unit needs to travel to pass the progress test. Back to the unit's repelling force. I want them to get them to stop bumping so much during even small contacts. I want them to repel enough that they're not intersecting, but not have there be a huge gap. I tried doing the calculations. I even made this image in PowerPoint, but I was still struggling. So I pulled some code from a previous project and changed it some. And now my units are moving much smoother in their groups. Now would be a good time to increase the number of units in the simulation to see if there's some other problem. I think there is some potential that a larger group of units is going to have harder time moving. So that's why I want to test it. Pretty nice for it being so early in the project. But I'm hours on this coding up project, and I'm yet to have a battle happen. So for the last segment of this video, I'm coding another player's units and adding a way for the units to fight each other. Getting player 2's units to exist was easy, but I can select the units of both players. That's not what's supposed to happen. Although, that sounds like a funny concept for a game. Two players having control of the same units, one is trying to win and the other is trying to sabotage your efforts. That'd be an interesting twist, although that's not what I'm doing here. For now, I simply gave another condition where a unit doesn't get selected if it's not under my ownership. This is only a temporary fix, as sometimes in an RTS, players want to select an enemy unit to see its numbers. Something else to do is to make a way for these units to an attack. For now, I have two options, a melee attack or a ranged attack. I decided to go with the latter for my game's first weapon. One step at a time, I just focus on getting the units to produce a steady flow of projectiles. Something nice about the small steps approach to programming is that more frequent testing generally means less review if something goes wrong. This next step though was surprisingly difficult. I need a way to have the projectile approach the target unit. My idea was to give each unit a unique integer ID and have the projectile reference that ID, but I didn't know how to set that up. The way I know how to reference an item in an array list is to use the item's index inside the list but that index value can change and is not associated with the unit integer ID I was trying to set up. I was feeling drained, so I decided to take a break from the project. Surprisingly, it wouldn't take long for me to get another idea to continue the project. I could just make a unit variable inside the projectile class. This unit variable is used as the target, and it worked. Okay, nice. After conquering that barrier, it was mostly smooth sailing to get the rest working to something that is, for the first episode, acceptable. But as I was finishing the draft of this video's script, I remembered something. This is a game! If I'm gonna exercise my technical skills to make a game, I should have some fun with that game I just made. I went bigger than a 20 vs 20 fight. How about 200 vs 200? And the units are randomly scattered throughout a bigger arena.
Awesome. My strategy was to find which areas of the map I had a higher dominance at and grouped up my units. Despite falling behind in the early game, once I had assembled a decently sized group, I could exchange fire more efficiently. This strategy allowed me to turn the numbers toward my favor and eventually win the game. So where does the project go from here? There are various tasks. The one that stands out is programming some terrain. Consequently, that also means making the units move smarter so they can navigate around these obstacles effectively. I have a long way to go on this if it becomes a more developed RTS. But what you saw in this episode only took me about a day. And before I even posted this video, I have already started to work further into the project. So expect some more content like this soon. I think there is a way that you can get notified for when I release that video. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching.